Well, I'd like to I'd like to tell you what what we're doing here today. I I was praying to God for what what should I share with you guys? And I I immediately just thought of the book of Galatians. That's one of the books I go to just about all the time. The reason I go to that a lot is because it attacks legalism. People who are trying to earn their way to salvation. And it's saturated with the gospel of Christ. And it, bring, and it shows the credibility of the Bible. Uh, one of the reasons I went there all the time was because I had a close friend. And uh, he was a strong Christian man, or at least I thought so at the time. And uh, very passionate about the gospel. And I, I really looked up to him. I admired him. He was one of my closest friends. And then something really tragic happened. He, he didn't die, but it was like he died. He was persuaded by false teachers. Uh, these, people, these people were basically teaching the same theology that the Judaizers were teaching back in the day. That... He, he had a little bit of a twist to it. You, It's not that you have to become a Jew first in order to become a Christian. It's that if you become a Jew, God looks at you with more favor and you're, you're better than all the other Christians. He says if you get circumcised and follow the whole Mosaic Law, that... Uh, that you're doing what God wants. And if you don't, you're the least in the kingdom of heaven. But you're still saved, but only by the skin of your teeth. And that's something that when I heard about it, I was so upset and I cried and I prayed for him all the time. I, I still do. I still pray for him that he turns to the truth. And I, when I heard about it, after I prayed about it, I studied the whole Bible. Well, not the whole Bible. I studied the whole, all the New Testament and as much as the Bible as I could. I was just searching the Scriptures to see what I could bring to Him. And I found that just about the whole New Testament talks against this theology. And one of the greatest helps I found was Galatians. And I would like to start today in Galatians chapter 1. Now this part of Galatians is showing the credibility of Paul's message, the credibility of the gospel. So I know that, we're, that he's addressing the Galatians, but who specifically is he addressing? Let's start, let's start with the first two sentences. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers that are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Now what is Galatia? Is it a city? Is it a country? No, it's a region. It's kind of like a state here in America. There is several cities in it, and Paul went to several of these cities and established many churches. Um, the I think the first thing we see uh, of this is in Acts 14. I'm going to read it to you. Acts 14, 1 through 7. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with the rulers to mistreat them and stone them, they heard of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of, Ly of Lyconia and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Well, that's pretty interesting. The first 
thing that Paul faced in Galatia was opposition. He still had some believers there, but there was opposition. Let's see what happens next. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, immediately looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, looked and said in a loud voice, Stand up right on your feet. And then he sprang up and began walking. And the crowd saw what Paul had done, and they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was a chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple had the, was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news. And you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And in past generations he, showed, he allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews from Antioch and Iconium, having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. But when the apostles gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went, up, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe, and they had preached the gospel to that city, and they made, had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith saying that through many tribulations one must enter the kingdom of God. And they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting. They committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So what do we get from this passage? Paul was really well known in Galatia. He, in fact, after this, he went there in all of his missionary journeys. He returned there to strengthen the churches, preach to them. And he performed miracles there. He, uh, some people believe that he that he died and rose to life. That's what I personally believe. But even then, after being stoned, you're not really going to get up and start walking around. So it was still a miracle, even if he didn't die and rise from the dead. And he, this is this is another thing. He was addressing people who had just turned from the gospel. So what happened? Well, Judaizers, uh, Jewish believers, were saying, well, you have to be circumcised and follow all the laws of Moses in order to be saved. Paul reminds them of the gospel message in his prayer to God in the next few verses in Galatians 1. Galatians 1, 3 through 5. Grace and peace to you to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever Amen so why was he reminding them of the gospel because he didn't want them to be ignorant he didn't want them to be following this false teaching in fact this is the only church in his in his epistles that didn't have anything good to say about the church. He quickly addresses the problem in Galatians 1, 6 through 7. I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some of you who trouble, who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. This isn't another gospel. This is a distortion of the gospel. This is putting shackles and chains on chains on the Gentiles that believe in Christ. Paul is so angry at this, but that what he says in the next few verses 
is, is amazing. Galatians 1, 8-9. Eight, eight but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. This was an accursed message that we had to be circumcised and follow the laws of Moses in order to be saved. This is completely new doctrine. This is something that is completely against the gospel. But other than that, what is Paul trying to get across? Well, let's go back to verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul is saying that he is an apostle, that, he's, that his message should be heard. He's not trying to be lofty and high. He's just stating the facts. He's telling the truth. He's trying to prove that he's not seeking the approval of man, but he's trying to seek the approval of God. We see this in, Gal in Gal Galatians 1.10. For, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. He is not trying to please man, but God. See? He's not trying to please man, but God. He would not be a servant of Christ. A better translation would be slave of Christ. He is. He has put himself under the subjection of Christ as a slave. A servant can just leave and come and leave it as he wants. He can serve him if he wants to. He can not serve him if he wants to. A slave is entirely obedient to his master. The Greek word that we see in that is the word doulos. And that is the exact word for servant. Uh, that, that they translate a servant here as servant of Christ. But it, it should be a slave of Christ. You see, to further his evidence, to further explain that he's not trying to gain the approval of man but of God, he tells them his conversion story. Because it is good evidence. Verses 11 through 14. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was, that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I that for the traditions of my fathers. Paul was one of the best Jews out there. He studied under uh, Gamaliel one of the big, biggest guys in the Sanhedrin. One of the most respected teachers in the Sanhedrin. Paul says in other epistles that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was, he was under the tribe of Benjamin. The right hand tribe. Best Jew out there. And then he just calls it rubbish, nothing, a waste, literally a waste. Why? What happened? What happened to this Jew who was the most righteous Jew out there, most self-righteous Jew? If anything could be said good of him, it would have been him. It, it, it would have been, he was the best Jew, he could follow the law to a T. What happens in Acts 9? Let's look at Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, 
whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell on the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to, into Damascus. For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go into the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again to be, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell, fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again and was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. A guy completely dead set against the way Christianity, against anyone who, pre who preaches Jesus Christ died and rose from the again. Uh, and rose from the dead. And all you have to do is repent and believe in Him. And then you should be baptized. He was said dead. Dead set against them. It was abhorrent to Him. He would not listen to any man. What God do? He appeared himself before Paul. Paul knew. Paul knew this was true. He knew now that the way was true. How can you explain someone who is dead set against something and suddenly turning? You're going to want some pretty... You're going to want to know what has happened. And then you hear this, you have to know it's true. You have to. People don't just do that. They're like, hmm, I'm just going to kill all my wife and children for no reason. People don't do that. Not, not, people, who, not people who love their wife and, wife and kids. You don't just, or, or maybe like a psychopath, killing, all, killing people left and right and then suddenly turning nice and gentle and wouldn't dare touch a fly, wouldn't hurt anybody. Something like that. That's about as extreme as it gets. There's other evidence to show this. I mean, he, he was holding, he was protecting all the coats of those who stoned, Saul, uh, stoned Stephen. I mean, why? Why were, what happened? Here's, here's, here's what it says in Galatians 1, 15 through 17. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, and not be and I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go to Jeru up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. He went back. And preach the gospel there. What does it say at the end? What happened? Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted to get acquainted with Peter and Peter and stayed with him fifteen days. 
I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that I... I assure you before God that what I am saying is not a lie. Later I went to Silica, Syria and Silica, and was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us now is preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. They knew it was true. They're like, wow. This gives us faith. This gives us confidence that our message is true. We can be assured that this is true. This is actual, reliable, historical documented evidence. These were eyewitnesses. They had personally seen Jesus Christ's miracles, his teachings. They watched him die, and they saw him rise from the dead. Then they, they were preaching the gospel and baptizing people. And they suffered, and they died for their message. Now, you, now, one can blindly believe in something and die for their message. People do it all the time. But when you have eyewitnesses, people who say they saw it, that means if it's true, it's good stuff. If they're telling a, if they don't, if it's not true, then they're telling a lie. People don't die for lies. People don't die for, no, I'm just going to say to Jesus Christ. I saw Jesus Christ die and rise from the dead. I'm just going to die doing that for no reason if it's not true. What can we be assured of? We can be assured of that this is true, reliable evidence. We can be assured of that this is not false, that people actually did this. This gives me faith. This gives me confidence. It should give you confidence and faith too. Preach it, proclaim it, share it everywhere. Now, if you don't know the gospel, if you don't know what it is at all, I'm going to tell you what it is. God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man. He was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross so that anyone who believes in him will be saved. There are some things you should do. You need to repent, which means to turn from your lifestyle of sin and walk and try to and turn to Christ, saying you're going to follow him, submit to him. And then, as an act of submission, you should be immersed. It shows that you have died to your sins in the newness of life. Guys, if you don't believe that, uh, I'm sorry. There's consequences. That means you've rejected the truth. And you will go to hell. But, there's, but if you do believe, there is, there is good news. If you believe in this, have eternal life with Christ. You will worship in heaven with, with God. You're going to be in paradise. Please, I urge you to repent and believe this. The consequences are too extreme. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, Galatians 1, that we know the credibility of your gospel. That we can tell what Paul said is true. Lord, I, I just pray that you encourage everyone here and strengthen them. And uh, Lord, I just ask that those who don't believe will turn and will trust in you and will love you and will serve you. 
please help us to be able to defend the gospel against heresy. Please help us to show them from Scripture what the Bible says. If they don't believe that, then there's no hope. Only you can, only you can save them, Lord. I just, I just bring all this before you, name of your Son, Lord Jesus Christ.